Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lisa Thompson with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Um, I'm the Vice President of Policy and Research here. And we thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us for this webinar, which um, I call the truth about sex trafficking. Um, we're just going to give it another minute or so to let more people join and then we'll dive right in. Um, and uh, so first of all, let me say Happy New Year to everyone. I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed a uh, happy and festive holiday season and that your 2019 is off to a good start. So we're, we're just checking out a couple technical things here and we'll get started in a minute. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and begin now. And again, thanks for all of you who've been uh, joining in. We're getting a lot of people uh, joining online. So thank you for, again, for joining us. Um, so let's just move right along. Um, we not sure how all of you came to know about this uh, presentation that we'd be giving today, um, how you got connected with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. But I would just want to take a, a couple minutes here to talk a little bit about our organization and what we do. So we've been in existence since 1962 and we work on a wide range of sexual abuse and exploitation issues, um, particularly highlighting the intersectionality between different forms of sexual abuse and exploitation. Um, it's our strong belief that all of us who are working in various spaces, uh, whether it be child sexual abuse or uh, domestic violence, campus sexual assault, anti-sex trafficking, pornography related issues uh, that we could all uh, really probably do a better job of understanding how various forms of sexual, other forms of sexual exploitation impact our particular fields. And what we've seen is that sometimes people tend to get siloed, they're down in their lane, and maybe they're not seeing some of these intersectionality issues. And so Part of our, a uh, lot of our emphasis here is on drawing those connections and pointing those, highlighting those for people. And we do work um, here at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation on everything from issues like sexualization of children, prostitution, violence against women, object the issue of objectification. But our cornerstone issue has traditionally been the issue of pornography. Um, and so we really like to particularly highlight that thread of that issue and how it relates to these particular forms of sexual abuse and exploitation. So thank you again for joining us. And I should also put in a little commercial right here because coming up in February, uh, actually February the 11th, we will be launching our annual Dirty Dozen list. I know probably a lot of you are familiar with it, but for those of you who are not, it's our really flagship program that a lot of people love and are most, are how a lot of people become acquainted with our work. And as part of the Dirty Dozen list, what we do is name 12 mainstream entities, whether that be government agencies, uh, big corporations, or even in some cases, um, nonprofit organizations who may in some way facilitate, profit from, or promote sexual exploitation and abuse. 
So um, we have the launch of the 2019 list coming up um, February the 11th, and we hope that you'll tune in for that. We've got some exciting and different types of editions this year, so we'll think you'll find that quite interesting. Okay, so moving on to um, the topic today, we are talking about sex trafficking, and I just wanted to focus, give you some highlights, a little bit of an update on some of the, the current, it, what we know about what's, um, what the trafficking landscape looks like in the U.S. right now. And then look at, we're not actually going to get to all 10 key points today. Uh, we're going to be doing a truncated version of this presentation, but we're going to look at some of the key foundations that really support and uphold um, um, the unfortunate phenomenon of sex trafficking. So what are some of the current dynamics? Well, if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend to you that everybody take a look at a report that was released last year by the Human Trafficking Institute. It's the 2017 Federal Human Trafficking Report. And this report, I think, is one of the first efforts that I've seen that gives us really good, hard data about the kinds of cases that, are in, uh, that exist across the country. And what they did at the Human Trafficking Institute was basically assess um, the various the cases that are in the federal court system right now, or actually at that time, the, the cases of trafficking that were in the federal system and assess them and break, break down the demographic information, the types of cases, disaggregate data so that we would get a better sense of what's currently going on in the field. So when they did that, they saw they broke out the cases in terms of criminal cases and civil cases and sex trafficking versus labor trafficking cases. So you can see that there are um, a lot more sex trafficking cases proceeding in the court system versus uh, labor trafficking cases right now and that predominantly uh, the cases involve child victims. Um, adult victims make up a much smaller percentage of that total. And then there are, of course, some cases that involve both children and adults. And occasionally, for some reason, which is hard to understand how those could happen, there are instances where the victim's age is undisclosed or unknown. So um, this gives us a, a, a you know, very helpful picture about what's going on in the, the going on in, in the recent in recent history. And I know for those of us who've started out in this work many years ago, this is really exciting to see that we have this many cases actually working their way through the federal system uh, from back when we had zero. <laughs> so this is maybe we all, I'm sure we'd all like to see these numbers be even higher in terms of um, find, you know, ferreting out and discovering where these things are happening. But I think this definitely is a great side, a sign of momentum and progress in our field. Now, additionally, what I think is particularly helpful about the report is that it um, helps us break out some of the, the types of trafficking, get us to see who's involved. So in terms of the victims, we get some more disaggregated information. So we see that currently by, by type, 55.6% of sex trafficking cases are of children only. Um, almost 15% involve adults. And then we have this combination of cases that where there's sex trafficking of adults of children. Um, and then only uh, four, roughly 4% 4 of cases are um, labor trafficking related. So predominantly then uh, sex trafficking cases are making up the bulk of what's working its way through the, the, the court system or the judicial system. Now, also particularly helpful to us is this information that they shared about the types of business models. So you'll see that in terms of the sex trafficking side of the report, when they broke down, looked at the types of business models that were undergirding or that were part of the sex trafficking scenario, internet-based commercial sexual exploitation uh, was overwhelmingly prominent. Uh, so that made up almost not quite 85% of the total. Now it's important to keep in mind that when this report was done, you know, Backpage had not come down at that point. And of course, Backpage at that time was the major kind of kingpin or, you know, the, the big gorilla in the room when it came to online sexual exploitation. 
uh, now that uh, the Department of Justice has taken it down, there um, we are lots of organizations and, and, and activists across the country are trying to keep an eye on see what kinds of organizations are um, like copycat uh, similar mo business models operating online with the classified advertising will be popping up to take the place and to gain market share from the back page collapse. But for now, we do know that there's been a significant amount of market disruption in the online um, sexual exploitation market. So that's very encouraging because basically what that does is make it more difficult for the demand to connect with those individual the people who are being marketed for sex on these online sites. Um, so that's what we're going for to try to create market disruption so that the demand doesn't have such an easy time of accessing people that they can exploit. And by demand, I mean sex buyers. I'm sure for those of you who are in this work, you're very familiar with that term, but you know, we've, um, we might have a very diverse audience um, tuning in online. And so not everyone may understand the concept of demand, but when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about the individuals who are seeking to buy sex from, or actually to buy a person to use for sex. So in terms of um, sex trafficking, then I think for some of the folks of us who've been around a long time, it's a little bit difficult to shift our thinking because we've thought about sex trafficking and sexual exploitation as being a street-based phenomenon that was going on in our communities in red light districts. But with the advent of the internet, um, it has come to be a very internet dominated form of exploitation. And of course, this report bears that out. Uh, of course, there still is street-based uh, commercial sexual exploitation happening. It by no means disappeared. And it might be on the rise slightly. We're not sure with the demise of Backpage. Uh, but I mean, I think that story remains to be seen, but it still exists. And of course, there are um, illegal brothels that exist in various fronts. Um, those can, which is interesting because you'll see massage parlors listed. Um, I would call those illegal brothels as well, but they do often operate under a particular front um, of massage parlors. So anyway, I think this is just kind of helpful to, to show us uh, what's going on and how important the internet has been to the um, explosion and basically like this is massive explosion in sexual exploitation that's been facilitated by the internet. Okay, so with that, that's just a little bit of an update about some of the trafficking, um, give us a, a sense of what's happening in, across the country and where we are. I want to just today make some foundational points about um, sex trafficking that I think are unfortunately sometimes overlook. Now for some people who are in this field every day, this might be elementary. Uh, for others of you, it might there might be some new ideas here. So I hope it'll be something for everyone. It's, it's hard to know with such a diverse online community tuning, tuning in, but hopefully there'll be something that everyone can take away. Um, so what are some of the foundational points about sex trafficking? Well, in particular, I think it's really critical that we consider the context. And when we're talking about sex trafficking, the context is the sex trade. Or sometimes I would use the term prostitution interchangeably with the term sex trade. Um, but it's anywhere where forms of prostitution are happening. That's where people are sex trafficked. They're sex trafficked into those types of settings. And we wouldn't consider other, like for instance, forms of labor trafficking without considering the context in which the labor exploitation is happening. So we know, for instance, that you know, the fishing industry for, is, a, is a context in which there's a, particularly, a particular concern about labor trafficking or labor exploitation occurring. There's something inherently going on that in that industry that is lending itself to um, people being exploited. And so we have to also consider the context when it comes to sex trafficking. So what I'm, my point here is, is that it's intricately and uh, inextricably intertwined with the sex trade. 
And we have to consider this because with, with like the quote here on the page says, talking about sex trafficking without considering prostitution is like talking about slavery without considering the cotton fields. And of course, nobody today would, can, you know, can't have a serious analytical conversation about um, the transatlantic slave trade without considering the role of the, you know, the southern economy and its agricultural base and how that fed into the transatlantic slave trade and then how you know cotton growers needed laborers. So context is critical. So if context is critical, then what is the prostitution context? Well, um, of course, strip clubs um, are often fronts for prostitution. Prostitution is happening there. I, I know for people who've never visited a strip club, that might not, it might, might, that information might be somewhat of a surprise, but yes, prostitution happens at strip clubs. And in fact, there have been a number of trafficking cases uh, into strip clubs. So strip clubs are sort of a prime location for us to consider when we're looking to identify victims. And of course, as we saw on the um, list of places where trafficking is happening, we saw um, massage parlors listed. And I would say to me that this is one of the most untapped places when it comes to looking for um, human trafficking victims if we consider the um, illegal uh, massage parlors. So for instance, right in here in, the, in my neck of the woods, because we're based in Washington, D.C., just a stone throw away over in um, Fairfax County, Virginia, we know that there are dozens and dozens of um, illicit massage parlors that are operating, which are essentially brothel fronts. And we know that many of the women who are in these establishments are trafficked, particularly from Asia. So I think um, we have sex traffic trafficking operating pretty much in plain sight um, it's just that it's happening behind this facade of a, you know, a loan establishment where the community just sort of turns a blind eye and doesn't really look deeply into what's going on there. So massage parlors, and of course, in some parts of the world, um, you have um, legal and established red light districts and you have open um, like brothel based prostitution or um, women prostituting out of windows um, at the street level. And then, of course, uh, the online presence of the sex industry, which we've already, I've already mentioned at, at some length. But I, I included this particular example of Rent Boy intentionally because I wanted to just point out that it's not just females who are exploited this way or who are trafficked for prostitution, but also men and boys. And Rent Boy is a website that was shut down by the Department of Justice uh, there was trafficking going on on its site, and um, the, the Department of Justice uh, did an investigation, seized a bunch of records, and ended up um, prosecuting the, the people behind this website, and um, there, there was definitely trafficking going on there. So just want to make that point. So strip clubs, massage parlors, brothel-based prostitution websites, and of course, also um, pornography. Now. I didn't show you a picture of pornography. I hope you appreciate that. <laughs> um, but what I'm trying to say here is that there are consumers behind the screen and people who um, are partaking of um, these depictions of pornography who they basically are participating in the commercial sex trade even if they're looking at um, free porn because somebody somewhere is getting paid something um, to perform these various acts and um, not everybody who is involved in the pornography industry is doing it um, without coercion, without force or fraud. So it's important that we look at the pornography industry as a sector where um, sex trafficking victims can be present. Now, so we've talked about the context. We've talked about how the sex trade itself, the existence of prostitution is foundational to the operate to the very mere fact that they're sex trafficking. Because obviously these individuals are not being trafficked to bake brownies, they're being trafficked for the purposes of providing commercial sex. So we have to look at where commercial sex is happening. 
but also when victims are trafficked, they're often trafficked into more than one sector um, or form of the commercial sex industry. So my point is, is that there's fluidity between sexually oriented businesses and the movement that goes on there. So SOB, that stands for sexually oriented business and intersectionality, or you might say fluidity. Uh, basically my point being that victims can be exploited in more than one form um, of the sex trade. So that's something that if you're working with victims, uh, if you're providing services, I think it's important on your intake and assessment at time to question, uh, of course, to the degree appropriate based on trauma and so forth, but to the degree possible at the appropriate time to question those you're providing services to about the various sectors of the sex trade in which they experienced um, exploitation. Were they used um, in the stripping industry? Were they used in the production of pornography? Were they a cam girl uh, working online but being pimped, um, you know, with a pimp behind, you know, somewhere in the shadows? These are important questions. Um, and because, for, for instance, I think one thing that can happen is people can be hyper-focused, per se, on the fact that someone was being prostituted in kind of maybe a traditional way of being sold on the street, let's say. But maybe they were marketed online and had pornographic images made of them. And what we know is that the mere existence of these pornographic images can be as traumatic as the, of the experience of sexual abuse of being bought and sold itself because those images are permanently out there. They're not retractable. It's this permanent record of their exploitation that they have no control over and it really creates a sense of powerlessness and helplessness. Um, and so, you know, ascertaining the degree that this may have happened to an individual is I think an important part of the, um, the services that we provide because it can help in terms of the therapy um, the kind of therapy that you want to provide and the understanding of the impact of having pornography made of you and being distributed out there by people that you have you know now have no control over and of course i think this also points to the possibility of complex trauma because people are being exploited in so many different ways uh, and, you know this could create situations of complex PTSD. So scratching beneath the surface, asking more questions about the ways in which the sectors in which they may have been exploited and, and feeling the, the survivor out about um, how they feel about their exploitation in these various places could help be, be very helpful. Um, and studies, you know, bear this out. They show that this intersectionality happens, that um, women are prostituted in multiple forms. Um, this is a study um, that showed that individuals were being used in, in, in what they called euphemistically escort services, which we should be calling prostitution <laughs> services. Um, they also were using a euphemistic term, exotic dancing, which I would call stripping. Um, the women were involved in street prostitution and drug house prostitution. So they were being moved and used in various ways. Um, another study, uh, really a seminal study on the issue of um, prostitution, found that um, this was a study of prostitution in nine countries, that pornography was very integral to, um, the to their exploitation. In fact, almost half of the women were having pornography made of them, and they're, they're almost the same number were being asked by the sex buyers to have them do things that they had seen in pornography. So here we're seeing again a little bit more intersectionality between pornography, prostitution, and um, potentially sex trafficking. Now, another point that's important to make is, is that the, the mere fact that prostitution itself harms of course, so we've, we've established that the context of sex trafficking is the sex trade. Uh, we've talked about how people who are trafficked are used in various forms of the sex trade. And if you're in the sex trade, what might be happening to you? So we know that not 
everybody in the sex trade is trafficked. I would never make that claim. I would not make that argument. But I would argue that prostitution by and large harms those who are in it, whether they are trafficked or not. So what I'm really advocating for here is that the people who are working particularly in say the anti-sex trafficking space that we broaden our lens we broaden our perspective or our area of concern so that we are also encompassing those individuals who are in prostitution who we may not know whether or not they were trafficked maybe they don't have a pimp that we can clearly identify um, they don't necessarily we don't see um, a, a drug trafficker who's manipulating their addiction in order to make them um, be engaged in the sex trade. Uh, we don't see overt signs of third, uh, third party individuals being involved in their exploitation. But that doesn't mean that prostitution isn't harmful to those people who are involved in it. And in fact, I would just argue that the mere existence of the sex trade uh, you know, it's creating this giant vacuum um, that's dependent upon, it, it needs people to fill it. Um, and I would argue that a lot of the times the people who are filling that vacuum are coming from the margins of our society. They're people who have experienced all kinds of vulnerabilities, uh, harms, whether they be econo um, like economic vulnerabilities, uh, disenfranchisement, and um, maybe they have minority status. Um, maybe they have economic hardships. Um, and of course, some oftentimes they're coming from households where there's been acute neglect of various kinds or even physical and sexual abuse. So these, we know that these are the pathways for many, many people who end up in the sex trade, that they have these indicia of harm that um, was like all these red flags and so they end up then in a sex trade that really has a predatory dependence on using people who come from these kinds of vulnerable backgrounds. So in terms of the harms of prostitution, um, they can be um, quite extensive. Um, you know, they're really, the, the harms, the things that sex trafficked persons experience in prostitution, the violence, uh, from buyers, the, the violence from traffickers and pimps, um, the, the violence from perhaps law enforcement officials who are corrupt, who, who might be taking advantage of people. Um, these are the types of, these are the same experiences of people in prostitution. Now, it could be that you have people who, you know, I did, go, I did mention um, pimps, and traffickers, you could, you know, a lot of times people in prostitution um, say that they're working independently, but at some point in their life have had at one point or another uh, an individual who was coercing them. So that was their initiation into the sex trade. So they've been initiated through a form of coercion into the sex trade. And I think that's an important point to keep in mind. <clears throat> All right, so we're not going to go through and and minute detail, the harms of prostitution. But I would um, encourage you all to check out our website at insexualexploitation.org. We have a project called Bright Light on the Red Light, where you can access information, where we pull together uh, a booklet that documents, goes through a lot of the research that's available documenting the forms, the, the, the violence that women experience in prostitution. And we're not even talking about the psychological harms or the physical harms. We're just talking about the sheer presence of uh, physical violence and sexual assault in prostitution. I think you'll find that very informative. So check out Bright Light on the Red Light on our website. Now, just to re, um, give an example of the um, the types of the way that unfortunately it's just so tragic that people in prostitution are so vulnerable. Um, this study found that those who were in, in prostitution were nearly eight ti 18 times more likely to be murdered than women of similar age and race 
not involved in prostitution activities and 51 times more likely to be murdered than if they worked in a liquor store, which was like the most next highest risky place a woman could, could work. Now, I think this is indicative of something highly problematic about involvement in the sex trade. Uh, I think we should look at this data and say, gosh, something must be horribly wrong with being involved in the sex trade if we have um, murder rates uh, like this going on for those who are in, in, involved in prostitution. The average age at death for those individuals was 34 years. So they're only the average age of death, of course, 19% of that was homicide. 18% um, died through drug ingestion. 12% was attributed to accidents. 9% was alcohol related and 8% was HIV AIDS related. So really incredibly um, high rate of homicide and drug ingestion. And I also would point out the, the drug problem and the alcohol problem. So what we see, what this I think is, is telling us uh, is that in order to cope with the, the violence, the, the psychological trauma of being engaged in prostitution over the long term, um, individuals need drugs and alcohol in order to cope. And unfortunately, that can hasten their death. Now, what you're seeing here um, is a series of arrest photos this is of a young woman, she looks quite young, um, who was serially arrested for engaging in prostitution. And what I'd like you to note is the deterioration in her affect over the period of time. Um, these photos were collected by a, a, a vice cop who was um, working you know, we're obviously working vice, encountering lots of women in the sex trade, and no, who noticed um, the, the signs of the physical trauma that prostitution was taking on them over time. You can see the signs of violence. You can see what looks like the trauma on their faces. You can see how a beautiful young woman is turned into someone who, you know, looks almost like a zombie as a result of the um, various traumas that she's endured. And there's quite a few of these. I'm only going to show you three. Um, I'm going to see three individuals, I should say, which is another example. Quite startling, shocking, horrifying. So it's, it's very just evidence of tragedy. So that's just to sum up my point that prostitution is harmful. Uh, now moving on, I want to make the point that s s seems to get missed in popular culture um, because not so much now, but of course I would say maybe oh, seven, eight years ago, we were maybe riding the, the wave of the the pimp adulation that was going on in pop culture. There was just a celebratory, um, you know, pimps up, hose down kind of stuff that was going on over the, all over the place. And in fact, Pimps Up, Hose Down is the title of a film. Um, you had lots of hip hop songs that were talking about pimps and hoes, um, music videos, um, a song was award, awarded an Academy Award uh, for best song and it was all about how it's hard out here for a pimp um, and you know basically saying oh pimps have such a, a hard time but in fact I mean beneath the the hype and all the glamour that these folks were uh, piling on pimps the fact is they're sex traffickers pimps do everything sex traffickers do they recruit. So for those of you who are familiar with the definition of trafficking, you'll know that traffickers, what, the, what is the trafficking definition? It involves recruitment, harboring, transportation, provisioning, obtaining of a person for purposes of 
sexual exploitation by use of force, fraud, and coercion. Well, guess what? That's exactly a pimp's job description. If I was going to advertise for a pimp in the paper, that's what I would write. That's what they do. So while I would say that, obviously, well, just to reiterate the point that not all people, individuals in prostitution are trafficking victims, all pimps are sex traffickers. Um, and this is an important point. So I use the terms interchangeably. I, I don't see any distinction between them. I do think that a lot of times domestic sex traffickers tend to be called pimps more than sex traffickers. There's been this tendency to think of sex traffickers as people who are engaging in an international trade in human beings, uh, but it can be those who are you know, trafficking people domestically within our country's borders as well. So there really is no distinction. And I think it probably would be best if all of us started calling these people uh, sex traffickers more and, and not referring to them as madams or pimps as much because they're in the business of exploiting people for sex and using force, fraud, and coercion to do it. And the pictures here are just of a few people who have um, histories of pimping. So you might find this interesting. One of the guys, um, the one in the top left corner you see uh, pictured there, was actually a sports reporter who turned pimp uh, from New Hampshire. So I don't know why you would do that, but he decided to, he thought he'd do better as a trafficker. Um, and of course, <clears throat> The guy next to him was a pretty notorious pimp who went by the name Prince. He had the individuals who were part of um, his and the, the enterprise that he was running. He actually had a throne in his house and people would have to, you know, like go up to his, the women would have to go up to him in, in his throne. It's pretty crazy, um, but that's how it worked. And then you might be more familiar with the guy um, in the lower, the lower left corner, um, who we all know as Ice-T, uh, but what you might not know is that he is a former pimp as well. So while he's well known for his role um, on the show that has to do with, what do they call it, something about Special Victims Unit, <laughs> Law and Order Special Victim, uh, that had to do with victims who were sexually exploited. Um, he actually has a past of being a sex trafficker himself, and you can see him talking about it in a, a documentary. So, of course, that documentary was made some several years ago, and I'm not saying trying to say once a trafficker, always a trafficker, but there is a high degree of irony um, in that situation um, that I think is worth noting. And additionally, I just wanted to point out, too, that women also are sex traffickers, so that's why you, um, there's a woman featured here. Um, so, uh, not all the time, but frequently it's the women who are involved as traffickers have at least sometimes kind of graduated into that role. So they start out being a trafficking victim themselves and then end up being um, seeing a way out by kind of if you, the, uh, kind of adopting the attitude if you can't beat them, join them and becoming part of the sex trafficking operation and therefore recruiting others. Um, helping to post ads, um, just, yeah, and helping to manage and control the, the individuals who might be put part of particular traffickers, um, quote, stable. So I think we have to be careful when we are looking at women who have been arrested for sex trafficking. Um, it's really imperative that we assess what their role was and what their history was um, um, I know many of us in the movement are gravely concerned about the fact that across the country there have been instances in which prosecutors are bringing charges against individuals, particularly like relatively young women who were became involved in a trafficking situation as minors, um, but then maybe helped post ads online for another individual who was in that pimps operation, that traffickers operation. But prosecutors in some cases are bringing charges against those kinds, of, those girls. Now I don't understand how that's justice. I don't see how that serves anybody's interests that we would prosecute 
someone who's been a victim of sex trafficking for participating in the enterprise, which they were expected to do. Oftentimes they're expected to do this um, to help post ads and to help manage the others and help me. And it's actually part of their survival strategy to live. So it's, it's interesting, it's, it's complicated. It's not something I think we can decide on um, kind of a carte blanche kind of way, like across the board, but it, certainly I think it bears, you know, these kinds of instances need to be looked at very carefully. Um, and just throwing the book at young women who've been involved in some way in helping a trafficker is, when they've been trafficked them, themselves, I think is a, is a terrible injustice. Okay, so getting off my soapbox on that one and moving on. Uh, so now what you may hear, there's some, in some places, people are talking about these people who are traffickers as quote, third party operators. It's sort of a euphemistic way of covering up what they're doing. Uh, that basically, you know, these are, these are flush peddlers, plain and simple. These are people who are selling people. That's what they're in the business of doing. But they, there's been a move um, by advocates of the sex trade who want to see it normalized to refer to these people as third party operators to basically sanitize um, and relabel, rebrand what these people are. And I think this is uh, of deep concern and something that all of us in the movement need to be cognizant of, pay attention to. If you see it happening in a policy conversation in your community, you know you know something's up. <laughs> but um, I should point out that what I have, what we have pictured here are some real life pimps slash sex traffickers. These are some pretty, um, oh, rough, I mean, these individuals have done some despicable things. Um, I'd like to point out in particular in the lower left, we have Pimp and Kin. Now, he's most known for a book that he published called Pimpology, which lists, he, he basically goes on about these 48 laws of what he calls the game. And basically, it's all about how to psychologically manipulate and coerce women into the sex trade. And it's Pimpology, this, it's basically like a science or a how to traffic people. Now, when you call somebody like Pippin Ken a third party operator, you're definitely sanitizing the fact that this is a, a, a sexual predator. <clears throat> so again, oh, I'm getting a little soapboxy, but I just thought that was um, important to highlight that that's happening out there and something for everybody to be aware of. Oh, and also worth noting before I move on, on the, um, oh, let's see, I don't know if you can see using my mouse here, but the upper right is Dennis Hoff. Now, Dennis Hoff um, recently passed away. He was the famous pimp from Nevada who uh, ran several brothels there, um, was really well known, probably America's most famous pimp who I would consider a, a sex trafficker. Uh, he, he gladly embraced the word pimp, but he tried to distinguish himself from a sex trafficker. Um, but if you do much research about how Dennis Hoff operated, the types of tactics that he used, in fact, you know, demanding sex from women in his um, brothels, so they basically would have to have sex with the boss, uh, looking for vulnerable people to exploit. For instance, he at one point was auctioning off a young 20-year-old woman as America's top virgin. And in her case, she had this was highly vulnerable because her parents' uninsured house had burned down and she was desperately looking for a way to try to help her, her family. And so then, you know, generous Dennis Hoff said, well, hey, I can help you auction, so auction off yourself uh, as America's top virgin. So these are the types of things that these individuals do and just calling them third party operators is really adds insult to injury. Okay, fifth point to make today um, is that the prostitution of people who are under the age 18 is by that very fact 
sex trafficking. Let me say that again. So prostitution of persons under the age 18 is by that very fact, sex trafficking. In other words, it, individuals who are under 18, minors, cannot give meaningful consent to participation in commercial sex acts. They haven't reached the age of majority to make a determination that they can, that they want to quote prostitute or engage in prostitution to sell themselves for to others. These are minors. It's our responsibility as adults to protect them. Uh, if in fact, if an adult were to buy a person who's under 18 years old, the culpability for that is on the adult. Um, the adult is the one who needs to know, you know, who it is that they're having sex with, what age they are, and not knowing their age is not a defense. Um, so this is a highly important fact, and, in, and believe it or not, it's becoming, it's, it has been, and, it's, and I think increasingly controversial to make this argument, um, because there's, um, there are entities out there and activists who will claim that children can, you know, willingly participate in commercial sex. So as a movement, I want to encourage us all to be um, highly tuned into that and to obviously push back against that. There should never be an instance where children are um, just out there and, you know, adults can just buy them because, it, because there's not a third party in, intermediary involved in, in between. Um, children don't have the, we know that their brains are maturing and particularly as an adolescent, uh, they're at a they're at a risk-taking stage anyway. They're impulsive. Um, these are all things that put them at, at risk of any number of harmful activities of which prostitution would be a huge risk factor for them in the particular, you know, all kinds of consequences that could come from that. So <clears throat> all this to say, if a child, you know, if you've got a person who's under 18 and they're involved in prostitution, by that very fact, they are considered a sex trafficking victim and should be treated accordingly. So no criminal adjudication. Um, <clears throat> these are victims. I mean, it, it's astounding. It's still astounding to me, even though there's been so much progress in this area, that in some places we are still arresting minors for prostitution offenses, they're getting adjudicated, they're getting juvie records for being involved in prostitution. When in fact, if that kind of sexual abuse were to happen in a school context, the person who was slipping them some money for sex, would be, if it was an adult, would be considered a, a sex offender, would be prosecuted and would be sent to jail. So again, this is a situation in which context is so important the context of where the, uh, the prostitution is happening isn't happening in a school. And, um, you know, somebody is the teacher paying somebody money for sex or is the teacher just even abusing somebody for sex? Everybody gets that that's wrong. But if you change the context and you take the child out of a school setting, you drop them on a street corner, why is it that they're suddenly fair game to any sexual predator out there? That's crazy. But that's what happened. So anyway, um, I'm sorry to preach. <laughs> a couple more points. We've, we're getting close to talking about an hour already. It's amazing. Once I get going, I can get a little uh, windy on some of these topics. I hope I'm not um, boring you guys. But OK, here we go. Another one. Critically important point. Child victims, in other words, people who were exploited in the sex trade as children often grow up to become, quote, adult prostitutes. And I kind of alluded to this issue earlier. So you have people who are, you know, clearly would be classified as a trafficking victim when they're 17, they turn 18, bam, it's their birthday, and suddenly the protection of their age is gone. And now society kind of washes their hands of them. We can just say, well, these are willing adult prostitutes, when in fact, they've been conditioned, they've been groomed for continued exploitation in the sex trade. So this is my giant appeal to everyone listening. 
that we need to have concern and care for all adults in prostitution, whatever age, whatever, however old they are, whether they're 18 or 60, um, whether they're male or female or transgender, that these are individuals who often, as I've said earlier in this talk, have ex had many push factors. Again, these are individuals who are often on the margins of society. They, and, and oftentimes they started out in prostitution as, as children and have essentially grown up in the sex trade and now become its adults. And it's basic, now they're basically just public sexual commodities for everybody to be able to use. And everybody just says, oh, they're, they're just prostitutes. I mean, I've had people use that phrase with me and it just makes me, my heart sick when people use the phrase, just a prostitute. Nobody is just a prostitute. Everybody is a person. Everybody has human dignity. Everybody is worth more than being bought and sold and used by who knows how many individuals, you know, being used as um, a masturbatory tool. It's, it's just people deserve more than prostitution. Um, there's lots of manipulation and violence and control of adults in prostitution. I think this is another point I wanted to draw out here on, while I'm on this topic, um, that ways, it, 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 ways in which adults are controlled um, and minors, and this is just an example, of course, many of us have, uh, who've been working in this area are very familiar with what we call branding, or of course, this is a tattoo, which is essentially serves as a brand, as a label of a person as another individual's property. And we don't have time to go into this at length, but I just wanted to mention that. Now, <clears throat> in, critically important here, it is the sex buyers that create the demand. These are the people who create the entire sex market. So if we go back, if you think back to that very first thing that I was talking about, the context, and I was talking about strip clubs and massage parlors and the online internet sex trade and all that, the entirety of that is driven by overwhelmingly men who whose desire to buy sex fuels the entire market. So every single person who's in the sex trade is a reflection of the male of a male sex buyer. They wouldn't be there if there weren't people ready to buy them. So in other words, if you were, if we were somehow able to change sex buying behavior, or if we could magically wave a magic wand and get you know stop sex buyers from buying tonight the sex, sex trafficking would disappear tomorrow the sex trade would disappear tomorrow because everybody the only reason people are involved traffickers and so forth are involved is to make money is to fulfill the demand um, to profit off that demand that exists so the real linchpin then of our efforts if we are serious about combating sex trafficking, we have to be serious about combating the demand. So really, I guess I should say, like I have two ultimate points here that I wanna to make today is that our, our efforts to combat sex trafficking are only as effective as our efforts to combat prostitution and the sex trade and to help those in it. And they're only as effective, our efforts to fight sex trafficking are only as effective as our efforts to curb sex buying behavior, to stop the demand. These are two fundamental points um, that are key to our success in abolishing sexual exploitation. You know, all, you know, all of prostitution, to borrow a phrase from um, Alex Trudeau at Demand Abolition, it's, it's a buyer's trade. This is a buyer's market, 100%. So I want to close up with this point of um, which you were supposed to have some text on here, but I'll just tell you guys, I'll confess that I was having a lot of trouble getting this presentation ready today. Instead of, I could tell you that the dog ate my homework. Um, it wasn't quite that bad, but the program ate my slides. I'm not lying. It was, I would make a slide, move on a couple, and then go back and the slide would be gone. And I, it happened multiple times. So it was like such a disaster preparing this presentation, but 
Um, at any rate, uh, what this was going to say was, is whose choice is it? So prostitution, the sex trade, is a reflection of male sex buyer choices. This is the choice um, discussion that we need to be having. When we're talking about prostitution, sex trafficking, there's so much that gets wrapped up in about the, the choices of the individual women. What I don't understand is why we're not talking about the choices of men who believe they have, that they're entitled to buy other people's bodies, to buy people to use for their sexual satisfaction. I don't understand that. Why aren't we having that conversation? So as we move forward from this presentation today, I hope everybody will go out with a really impassioned uh, drive, like that they want, you know, go out and let's have this conversation about the man. And in that regard, I want to um, point out to you a report that I just learned of yesterday. It's pretty astounding, exciting, um, that the state of Minnesota has uh, put together a proposal to advance a policy agenda in Minnesota that will target the demand for commercial sex. So their plan is to uh, decrease or potentially decriminalize those who are selling sex, but to increase the penalties for those who are buying sex. And this is mirroring what something called the Nordic model that's um, becoming, you know, in, in the anti-trafficking world is pretty well known. If, but if you haven't heard of it, it's the Nordic model. Um, Several different countries have adopted it. Of course, Sweden is the poster child of the Nordic model because they were the first country to adopt this kind of approach. So it's, this approach uses both uh, much more punitive uh, aspects towards the sex buyers, and it's, but it's very key that it be coupled with services for those who are in the sex trade so that when and if they're ready to leave the trade, that they have wraparound service, social services to help them get on their feet and find other ways to support themselves. Um, so with that, again, I want to say that this is a truncated version of this presentation. Um, I hope that what you heard today was uh, helpful and informative in some way. And if, again, if, if you're looking for more information, I highly encourage you to check out our website, in particular the, the section, our project, uh, Bright Light on the Red Light which is uh, quite informative. And just to let you all know, well, something that we haven't announced widely, it's, it's public, but it's not been widely shared. We're um, in the process of launching a new project called Face the Demand, so which will soon be coming to our website as well, in which we'll be highlighting these issues of, um, that I've been talking about today with sex buyers. So with all that, everyone, I'm, um, I've, we are right up at 4.30. I want to respect your time and let everybody go. But we thank you so much for joining in. And I just want to encourage you, if you haven't, please go to our website. You can sign up for our emails and get more notices about upcoming webinars. And if you're interested in ever having me share the fuller version of this presentation, please reach out and let us know. We could maybe see about doing that for you. So thank you, everyone. We, we wish you all the best in your efforts out there and stand strong and remember abolition. Oh, last, I have just a, a note from our, ed, from our control board editor here. He's asked me to please send us any feedback and questions you have um, about today's webinar to public at nicosi.com. Thanks everybody. Take care.